Porsche name has come to mean more than just the name of a German-made automobile. Their reputation has come from countless race championships, winning both on and off-road since the early 1950s. Their philosophy has been to use their race experience as the test track for their future production vehicles. The 911 development has demonstrated this philosophy well. At the time of its introduction at the Frankfurt Auto Show in 1963, the 911 was quite an exciting offering, with standard four-wheel disc brakes and a six-cylinder horizontally opposed engine. The 911 model has now been in production for over 25 years, with many variations being developed from the original model. Even the earliest 911 body style maintains strong similarities to today's models. They are all constructed on a chassis of similar design. The original 2-liter engine has evolved to today's sophisticated 3.6-liter Carrera 4, known as the 964. The horsepower in the 911 has ranged from 110 to over 214 on the 3.2 liter Carrera engine. The 930 turbo has grown from 3 liters in 1976 to 3.3 liters and the horsepower has gone from 258 to 300. Detailed model information can be found in the worksheet supplied with the video. of a new 911 now exceeds $50,000. With this in mind, you might consider a used Porsche. Selecting a model to purchase first requires doing a little research. You will discover that the newer the 911, the more options there will be available to you. These will come, of course, with a higher cost. When you begin to look, you will find the actual costs of a used Porsche to be high relative to other cars of their age. The demand for a used 911 is quite strong because of their long-term reliability and quality construction. Even with the tradition of quality cars, the risk of buying a problem car is great unless you know something about the car's ownership and service history. The expense to repair and maintain these cars should always be considered. Extreme care must always be taken before you make your purchase. Another important factor to consider when buying a 911 or 930 Turbo is the existence of gray market cars. With a strong U.S. dollar from 1984 through 1986, many Porsches built for Europe were imported directly to the United States by individuals and dealers at considerably less cost than going through the U.S. dealer network. If you are considering a car in this special group, you should be aware of factors that can affect their licensing and insurance. Additional detailed inspections for gray market cars are included in the video appendix. The following video was developed to make the present and future Porsche owner improve their skills for evaluating a 911 and 930. We have focused this video on those critical body and mechanical inspections which are needed to separate average cars from great cars. Thorough inspection of a car with the worksheets can save you thousands of dollars in future repairs. Before we begin the actual inspections, we will show you the 911 and 930 models which the video will cover, including the different body styles. The first model we will refer to is a 911. This six-cylinder model has been in continuous production since 1965. The basic body style is a coupe. It was also available with a sunroof. Another body style is a Targa, which has a removable folding roof section and an integrated roll bar. The newest body style is the Cabriolet, 
which has been available since 1983. The second model is a 930, sometimes referred to as a 911 Turbo. This has been in production since 1976. It is a turbocharged six-cylinder engine similar in design to the normally aspirated 911. The turbo primarily came as a coupe or sunroof coupe until the late 1980s when it became available as a Targa and Cabriolet model. Now some questions to ask before you look at the car. What is the mileage? How long has the current owner had the car? How is the car currently driven? To work? Errands? Only occasionally? Have the owner evaluate the car on the phone before you actually look at the car. You have been provided with copies of the Driven by Design body and mechanical rating worksheets. The video is made up of three parts. Part one is the body inspection. This will be followed by part two, the mechanical inspection. The third part of the video is the appendix. The appendix is a brief visual dictionary which will explain technical items of importance found in the video and will also give you a list of gray market inspections. For an auto inspection, we use a few simple tools, a flashlight, an ordinary screwdriver, and a vinyl magnet to check for body filler. Part 1, Body Inspection. The video will begin with the 911 body rating worksheet. Please take out your worksheet now. We have occasionally put the car on a hoist to make some inspections easier to see. Let's begin the inspection of the 911 body with a view of the floor pan. You can do these floor pan inspections on the ground, but for a more complete view, a hoist is recommended. 1. This inspection begins with the 911 on a hoist. In this position, look at the underside of the car for loose or hanging parts. Check carefully for parts that are not secured. 2. Now move toward the front of the car. Look for corrosion in or around the front torsion bar area. While under the front of the car, Look at the area directly below the battery on the driver's side. A previous repair can be easily noticed by comparing the right and left sides. This is a common area of rust and decay in many early 911s. If there is more than one battery, as in some pre-1972 models, you should inspect the battery area on the passenger side of the car also. Three. We'll now view the front of the floor pan from underneath the car. Check the floor pan from one side to the other. You're looking for rust or signs of damage. Look carefully for patches which may have been used to repair earlier damage. A patch may not pose a serious problem, but your inspection is important. Four. Now look for rust in the area directly under the pedal cluster. This inspection should be done from here, underneath the car, as well as above, inside the car. Do this inspection with the carpet and floor mats removed. Check around the gas pedal, as well as the bracket that mounts it to the floorboard. If you are interested in a more thorough inspection, have the floorboard behind the pedals removed and inspect underneath for rust. 5. Also inspect the outer floor pan seams. This is the main section of the floor pan, and this inspection is critical. Do this on both sides of the car. This is a good time to use your screwdriver to test the metal strength if the condition of the pan suggests rust. 
6. Inspect the rear floor pan under the back seat. Check for surface rust and rust through. Be especially concerned if you discover rust or damage to the floor pan of a targa. It does not have a roof for structural support. As a consequence, a targa with pan damage or rust will not be a good car. While in this area, also look for holes drilled in the floor behind the front seats. This will be a sign of a roll bar mounting location, telling you the car was raced in time trials or autocrossed. Cars that are raced are usually well prepared and maintained, but these events put excessive stress on a car. Seven, continue your inspection by working your way over to the jack receiver. Look in the jack receiver area for rust. Remove the plug. Look at the area under and on either side of the jack receiver. Also check for cracking in the rocker panel above the jack receiver. This is an early sign of body fatigue. 8. Look for rust in the rear torsion tube area. Check where the cover bolts to the chassis and the surrounding metal area. Test for strength. Also inspect the torsion tube carrier itself. This can rust and create a dangerous suspension problem. 9. You are on the driver's side of the car looking up at the area in front of the rear wheel. The buildup of wheel spray and mud will eventually cause rust through in this area. Use your screwdriver to test the strength. 10. Check the front trunk area by removing the carpeting and looking at the area around the gas tank. 10. are looking for a smooth appearance. If it looks like it may have been smashed and pounded out, this may be an indication of a previous collision. Another indication of collision repair is paint oversprayed on wires, rubber trim, or carpeting. 11. Locate the battery and inspect the area around and under it for rust or decay. 12. It is necessary to remove the battery to do this check effectively. Decay will occur from battery leakage. 13. At this time, also remove the spare tire and look at the trunk floor for signs of rust or indications of collision damage, such as wrinkles or gaps in the metal. 12. When you open the front trunk, look carefully at the hood's rubber seal. 12. Pry back the rubber seal to inspect the condition of the metal channel. You're looking for rust or indications of bodywork. Also check where the hood closes. When you lift this rubber seal, any rust or previous damage will be obvious. 12. While you have the trunk open, check for rust or repair damage under the lip of the hood. This area is vulnerable to collision damage and rust. 13. Does the front hood line up when closed?
follow the seam with your finger to detect irregularities. Do this on both sides. Fourteen. We'll now remove a headlight trim piece and look behind it for rust. If you do not remove the trim ring, look closely at the base for bubbling or rust. This check can also be done from inside the front fender by looking at the back of the headlight bucket. This is an example where you can see the amount of rust which has accumulated around the headlight ring and the deterioration of the headlight bucket. It's a good idea to check both headlights. 15. Look at how tightly the front and rear bumpers fit the body. 16. A front or rear collision will bend the mounting brackets, causing the bumper to sag, creating a gap here. 16 and 17. Check for rust around the windshield. Follow the metal trim around the window. Rust in this area can lead to water leaks inside the car and further deterioration. Also check the rear window trim in the same manner. Check carefully for a fogged or cracked windshield. You must be aware that small cracks, if not repaired, will continue to spread requiring windshield replacement. 16. On a cabriolet, inspect the plastic rear window for cracks or scratches. This is expensive to replace. 18. Look at the cowl, which is the area just in front of the windshield, for bubbling paint or rust. 19. Also check near the windshield and around the base of the antenna. This is a 1969 Porsche. On cars built after 1986, the antenna was built into the windshield. 20. In this 1971 example, you can see typical rust damage in the cowl area. 19. Look at the area just behind the fuel filler neck opening on the driver's fender. Open the filler flap and check inside for rust or damage. Also look under the fender well up toward the bottom of the filler neck. From this position you should be able to see any rust damage. 20. Look for rust in the front wheel splash area, especially in the outer corner of the splash area just behind the rocker panel. Look for mud or buildup of dried road debris. Clear any debris away and make sure the metal in this area is solid. 21. Check the lower and upper door hinges for damage or rust problems. Noticeable rust or bubbling paint in this area will be telltale signs of a serious problem. Use your screwdriver to test for strength. Also look for any signs of cracking or weld seams around the hinge which may indicate previous collision damage. 22. Look on the bottom of the doors for rust. Rust in this area usually occurs when these drains are plugged. For a better view, remove a few screws from the bottom of the interior door panel and check this area with a flashlight. What appears to be a small problem from below may in fact be a completely decayed inner door panel and door bottom, a case of rust from the inside out. 
23. Look for sagging or uneven door seams, especially in targas and cabriolets. Follow the seam to check for uniformity. Unevenness could indicate collision damage, chassis fatigue, or rust in the pan, causing the car to actually fold in the middle. Do the doors open easily and close securely? Check for binding when you try to close one of the doors. When inspecting open cars, always open both doors simultaneously. If there is structural weakness, the open doors will cause the body to sag, and of course the doors will bind. As you recall, a Porsche does not have a separate frame. For this reason, rust or damage in any one of a few panels will weaken adjacent areas. This is an especially critical inspection on an early model Targa. 24. Look for rust or bubbling of paint around the door strike plate. If there is rust here, the continuous sliming of the door will loosen the strike plate, requiring the entire door jam to be replaced. If the jam is rusted, a simple latch adjustment will not solve the problem. 25. Carefully check the trim strip around the rear quarter windows for rust. Twenty-six. Open the rear deck lid. Look at the corners near the taillight lens. Corrosion from road salts frequently shows itself here. Inspect around the taillight assembly at this time for rust or bubbling of the paint. Twenty-seven. Look at the roof lines for straightness. Notice any irregularities suggesting collision damage. 28. On cabriolets, check that the convertible top mechanism works and does not bind while being raised or lowered. 29. Also make sure on Targas and Cabriolets that the top closes securely on the windshield frame. A tight fit will minimize the probability of leaks. 28. Does the rear deck lid line up when closed? Does it close easily and securely? You can check the alignment the same way you inspected the front trunk lid. Collision damage will be indicated with this check if it has not been correctly repaired. These checks are important because if the deck lid does not fit well, it probably never will. A simple adjustment will not solve an alignment problem caused by collision damage. 29. Look at all the weather stripping throughout the car. Is it dried out and cracking? Inspect the door rubber as well as the wind wings and quarter window rubber trim. This could present a problem of water leakage and noise at high speeds and is expensive to replace. 30. Check the front trunk rubber trim. A poor seal here can cause water leaks and cold air drafts during winter months. 30. Look for cracking and deterioration of the rear rubber seal on a Targa top. This is the one fastened to the roll bar. It is a continuous seal about 8 feet long, beginning at the passenger's window and going over the top to the driver's window. It is very expensive and difficult to replace. 
31. Look at the overall paint quality. Are all the panels exactly the same color? Are there signs of paint oversprayed into the wheel wells, on the rubber trim, or around the windows and side moldings? Does it appear to have recently been repainted? A newly painted car is not necessarily a negative condition. It just requires you to make other inspections carefully. You want to be able to confirm that the paint was done to improve the car, not cover a problem. We will now begin to examine important areas of the interior. 32. Look for missing or damaged inside door pockets. These are very expensive to replace. Thirty-three. Check the carpet for water stains which may indicate past or present water leaks. Thirty-four. Inspect the condition of the seats. Do the driver's seat and the passenger seat match or has one been replaced? Heavy wear on the seats will be a major cost if you want to restore the interior to original condition. Check the carpeting for wear or damage. 35. Inspect the brake and gas pedals for wear, which can be a sign of hard driving or higher mileage than indicated. 35. Check for cracks in the dashboard. 35. A new dash is not that expensive, but the windshield must be removed to replace it. You must be aware that windshield removal will also require a new rubber seal. With these added considerations, dash replacement will not be simple or inexpensive. 36. Inspect the condition of the headliner. Replacement must be done by a professional or someone with great patience. The replacement is not easy and the quality of the replacement work will affect the overall appearance of the interior. Front and rear window removal is required to do the job properly. 37. Lift up the carpet and check the rear floor area behind the front seats for rust or damage. As you may recall, we had previously checked for floor pan rust from below. Also, if you fail to look for roll bar mounting holes drilled in the rear seat area, please do this check now. Now we'll move on to the body filler inspection. When a car is over a few years old, there is a great probability that there has been body filler used on it at some time. It may have been used to cover up rust in earlier models or when repairing an accident. Body filler itself is not a problem. Problems are the result of poor application. Be aware of its existence, especially when it has been used to cover up rather than repair. Here are a few ways to check for body filler. A. Inspect the lower edges of the body panels for gaps or roughness, especially on the nose. Roughness will indicate damage or the use of body filler. Continue your inspections by checking the rear valance. Also look at the rocker panels along the sides of the car. B. Inspect the lower rear sections of the front fenders. Water frequently settles here and causes rust. To check for body filler, use a vinyl covered magnet being careful to avoid scratching the paint. C. Inspect the doors for excessive bulging, which will occur if a large amount of body filler was used to cover up previous rust. Look along the entire body from the front of the car. This may help you detect bulging. D. 
D. Inspect the finish of the door edges and seams. Filler is frequently used here to cover rusting door edges. This can be detected by the thickness of the door skin seam. This is an example of a door showing the original thin even edge of the door skin which has never been repaired. E. Inspect the torsion tube cover on the rocker panel. When body work is done, the access panel is frequently covered with body filler. It is important to understand that a 911 does not have a frame like older American cars. For this reason, the Porsche's unit body construction makes the strength of each body part critically dependent upon another. Recognizing this condition, Porsche was a pioneer in rust-proofing their cars. They realized very early that a small amount of rust or collision damage would critically reduce the strength of their unit body car. Over time in the production of the 911, galvanized body panels were introduced to prevent rust. Here's a chart which represents the different stages of rust protection. Before 1970, rust protection consisted of the selected use of undercoating. From 1970 to 71, Porsche began to use galvanized pans and wheel well areas. Some 911s in these years have been found to have untreated floor or wheel well panels. Make a thorough rust inspection on models from these years, especially on pre-1971 Targas. The structural integrity of a Targa is greatly compromised by floor pan rust. Nine elevens built between 1972 and 1975 have galvanized metal floor pans and wheel wells. In the years 1976 and 1977, Porsche began to use more galvanized body panels throughout the 911. Some 911 models from 1976 and 1977 have been found to have some untreated body panels. It is advised that careful rust inspection be made on these years. After the 1977 model year, 911 bodies were all galvanized metal, thereby limiting the probability of rust. Beginning in 1978, the entire 911 body was galvanized and extended warranties were offered. Check the car you're interested in against this chart to see what to expect in the way of rust protection. Following the body inspections regardless of model year is very important. With 911s built before 1976, all cars should be checked out using our complete body inspection list for rust and collision damage. If there is no possibility of rust, collision damage might still be detected. Any car with a damaged part or repaired with a non-galvanized body part can rust, even though the rest of the car will not. Remember to note your findings and review them upon completing your inspection. Part 2. We'll now begin with the mechanical inspections for the 911 and 930 Turbo. Warning. While inspecting any car, never put your hands in the area of the running engine or near the hot exhaust system. All of the mechanical inspections can be completed standing a safe distance from the engine. The engine found in the 911 was developed in the early 1960s as a six-cylinder, two-liter engine. On the left, you see a 1967 911S two-liter engine contrasted with a 1987 3.2-liter Carrera engine on the right, and the evolution continues with the 3.6-liter Carrera 4. We will deal with two basic engines, the normally aspirated six-cylinder engine and the turbocharged version. The designs are similar, and the inspections will be sufficient for both. An important entry to the Porsche product line came in late 1975 with the introduction of the 930, often called the 911 Turbo. At the time of its introduction, 
there were few cars which could match its power, braking, and handling. Throughout the 930 production history, these models would receive special attention to details. The original plan was to limit production to 500 cars, but when demand exceeded all expectations, production was increased. The 930 received many internal and external improvements not found on the 911 until later years. The turbo had a more reliable air intake system when compared to the electronically injected 911. This system was not prone to unexpected failure like the air box in the fuel injected 911. We prefer 1978 or newer models because their design includes an air-to-air -air intercooler which operates like an air radiator system and reduces the turbo temperatures dramatically. The lower temperatures result in more engine power, better combustion, and longer turbo and engine life. A 930 is a very special car and requires careful inspection. Use the 911 and supplemental 930 inspections and check the appendix for additional technical notes. We have developed inspections that can be easily followed and understood as a summary of potential mechanical problems. A worksheet format of important questions allows you a quick reference list when inspecting a 911 or 930. Remember, to determine the value of a particular car and its engine, it is important to get a history of the work done on the car. Consider this like a doctor would when he asks for your medical history. Engine history. Here's some questions to ask. 1. Has there been a recent compression check or leak down test on this engine? Recent meaning within the last 5,000 miles. 2. Does the car have updated or recent repairs on the chain tensioners? The 1984 Carrera and newer style tensioners are preferred. 3. Has the engine been overhauled recently? 4. What recent service or repairs have been done? 5. If the 911 you are looking at is a 1975 or 76, it is critical to ask if the engine studs have been updated. These studs have been known to pull out of the engine case. Note, actual receipts with dates must be available to verify the work done. Otherwise, discount the value of the claimed work. Now we'll move on to tests with the engine off. Six, check all the engine belts for wear and cracking. Start with the air conditioning belt. Also check the impeller belt. Seven, check the belts for free play, which should be approximately one half inch. Eight, check oil filler neck and cap on the right side of the engine compartment for a grease-like residue. This is engine blow-by and it usually indicates internal engine wear. Remove the engine dipstick found under the filler lid. Check the color of the engine oil. If the oil is black or opaque, the oil is in serious need of a change. A honey color indicates clean oil or that there has been a recent change. Nine, check for oil leaks where the car is parked. Ten, clutch free play should be between one half and three quarters inches and is measured at the top of the pedal. Improper adjustment of a clutch can indicate clutch wear. This measurement only applies to models built before 1984. 11. Locate the oil tank in the right rear wheel well. The 911 and 930 have dry sump engines. 
the oil is not stored in the crankcase like conventional engines. Instead, it is stored in an oil tank and is pumped to the engine. Make sure there aren't any leaks from the oil tank. Early 1970s tanks were prone to leakage and are expensive to replace. 12. Check under the transmission for any fluid leaks. If the transmission leaks are noticed toward the front end of the car, it will not be a major cost to replace a seal. If there are leaks where the engine and transmission meet, it could be a sign of major expense. 13. Check the condition of the engine's heat exchangers on both sides of the car. These supply hot air which heat the interior of the car. Make sure you check the area that seals on the exhaust manifold. This will deteriorate over time and reduce heating efficiency. 14. Look at the bottom of the engine. Is it clean? See if any part of the engine is cleaner than another. This could indicate recent repairs. Note that effective cooling can only be accomplished by keeping these cooling fins clean. 15. Inspect the condition of the muffler shown at the top of your screen. In 911's built after 1974, emission laws will require that you have a catalytic converter or thermal reactor. Check the condition of any emission equipment. See the appendix for more information. 16. While under the car, check that the boots protecting the constant velocity joints or CV joints are in good shape. Broken or leaking boots will lead to costly replacements of the CV joints. 17. Inspect the front suspension mounts under the hood for damage or cracking, which will seriously affect the suspension settings. If a mount is broken, it can be repaired. On pre-1976 cars, if a mount is rusty, the car should be avoided. Remember to check both sides of the car. 18. Now some additional 930 inspections with the engine off. Eighteen, check the brake rotors for deep ridges like grooves in a record, necessitating the rotors be replaced. The brakes on the 930 were cross-drilled for better cooling, resulting in better braking and greater safety. Nineteen, review the car's service records carefully for frequent oil changes. This is a good service check because high turbo temperatures result in accelerated oil breakdown. Long-term neglect and poor maintenance will cause premature engine wear. Twenty. The 930 will frequently leak oil from the oil return tubes. This is not necessarily expensive to correct. The major problem is that dripping of oil on the hot thermal reactor will result in a smoking engine as it begins to warm up. Obviously, the smoke can create major fears in a seller or buyer. The oil return tubes are located above the thermal reactor, just below the cylinders. While you are looking in this area, Spend time to carefully examine the thermal reactor for heat deterioration as well as rust. The reactor is expensive to replace. 22. Electrical inspections with the engine off. 21 and 22. Check the battery water level. 
Also check the battery for signs of overcharging and acid buildup on the battery poles. Acid buildup is corrosive and will lead to electrical problems and body damage. Twenty three and twenty four. Find the fuse holder under the hood. Remove the cover. Look for any burned or missing fuses. This could indicate an electrical problem. Look for loose wires anywhere throughout the car. This can also suggest rewiring or previous electrical problems. 23. Suspension inspections with the engine off. 25. Check for a low brake fluid level in the master cylinder reservoir. This is located on the driver's side of the front trunk. Here you see the older style reservoir on the right and the newer style with servo power assist on the left. 26. Shake the wheels checking for looseness or rattles which may indicate suspension wear. 27. Check for wear on all tires. Look for cracks in the tire sidewalls. 28. Also look for uneven tread wear which could indicate suspension problems. Tire replacement will always be a major expense. 28. Look for cracks or suspicious damage to alloy wheels. 29. Do the tires sufficiently clear the wheel wells? At this time, also check that all the tires are the same brand and tread design. Different tires on a high-performance car will prove dangerous in certain driving situations. Since the early 1970s, the width of the rear tires has been greater than the front tires. This was introduced to improve the handling and safety of the car. 30. Remember, the front and rear tires should be the same brand and type. 30. Look at the front discs through the alloys or openings in the steel wheels. Check for scoring, which looks like deep grooves on a record. Also look for heavy buildup of rust. At this time, check that the emergency brake operates properly. If it does not work, it could be out of adjustment or its special brake shoes could be worn out from driving with a handbrake on. 31. Check for excessive steering free play. This could indicate worn suspension components. Is the steering easy or do you find some binding in the movement? If so, this could indicate one of many problems. 32 and 33. Hold the brake pedal down. Does it continue to sink toward the floor? If so, this is a serious problem with the brake system. Do not drive the car. Does the brake pedal get higher if you pump the pedal? This could be a sign of air in the brake lines, faulty calipers, or master cylinders. 34. From the back side of each wheel, look for signs of leaking brake fluid on the inside of each wheel or on the tires. 35. To check the suspension and shock absorbers, press down to create a springing action on each corner of the car. Look for the car's firm response to this action. Inspections with the engine on. 36. Have the owner hold the engine at 1200 RPMs. Listen for clattering of metal on the rear, right, or left of the engine. If a noise is apparent, then one or both of the chain tensioners may need replacement. 37. Listening to different engine noises is important. Notice if there are any unusual engine noises at idle. 
During your first car inspection, this question may be hard to answer. But after looking at a few cars, you'll be able to distinguish between different types of normal and not so normal noises. The sound can reflect the evenness and strength of an engine or just the opposite. Is the idle steady or does it fluctuate erratically? Does the engine run rough at idle and lower speeds but tend to even out as speed is increased? If so, this is possibly a sign of a burned valve. 38. After the engine is warmed up, have someone rev the engine to 4,000 RPMs. Listen to the engine from outside the car. Are there any unusual noises at high RPM? Stand a few feet away from the engine. You are listening for signs of major engine problems. 39. When the engine is started, the red oil pressure light should go out. Early models had a green oil pressure light on the bottom of the gauge. When the engine is running over 900 RPMs, the red generator light should go out, as in this case. 40. Are there any oil leaks while the engine is running? Check this by inspecting cardboard placed below the engine. Before checking the engine oil level of a 911, the engine should be running and warm and the car should be on level pavement. If the oil level is below the safety range on the dipstick, this indicates poor maintenance, endangering the engine. 41. Listen very carefully for any exhaust leaks like a popping sound or backfire. If you discover an exhaust leak, consider that we have always made it a rule never to buy a car unless the exhaust problem is first repaired. An exhaust leak will cover up other sounds that can indicate engine problems. 42. Check all the lights and electrical accessories to make sure they are functioning. Try the turn signals, the headlights, and high beams, fog lights, check the interior accessories. 3. Try the backup lights, the turn signals, the brake lights, and tail lights. Electrical problems can be as simple as a burned out bulb or serious enough to require rewiring. It's important to be thorough. 43. Is the speedometer glass smeared or cleaner than other gauges suggesting prior tampering? 44. Does the air conditioner work? Test it even in winter. Make sure the blower is operating. To check the compressor engagement, listen for a click in the engine area when the air conditioner is turned on and look for a small drop in the engine's RPMs. 9.30 inspection with the engine on. Forty-five. Check for excessive white smoke during the startup of the engine. This could indicate fuel consumption and turbo problems. Now we'll move on to the test drive. While test driving the car, make sure you vary your driving conditions. It is important to use actual driving conditions to pinpoint actual problems. Forty-six. When you depress the clutch for the first time, or any time for that matter, are there any noticeable sounds? This could be a release bearing problem or a clutch problem. The first check is to try reverse. Does it work? 40. Now try first gear. 41. When you test drive the car, allow plenty of time for all the parts to get warmed up and again listen to the idling engine for any unusual sounds. 48. When starting out, notice if the gears engage easily and smoothly. Is there noticeable clashing? There shouldn't be any chatter as the car starts moving. This could indicate clutch wear. 49, 50, and 51. Is it easy to find the proper gears when starting out? 
Note any shifting difficulties. Listen for clunks, humming noises, or other unusual sounds from the transmission. Clunks when starting out, as well as repetitive clunking in the rear when cornering, will be a sign of worn CV joints. Listen for wind noises. Air leaks can be water leaks on rainy days. Fifty-two. If you are with another person, have them stand outside the car and watch as you drive away. They should observe if the car actually drives away straight. Does it crab or drift right or left? If so, the problem could be a result of a previous accident or a worn or misaligned suspension. 53. Check the engine's gauges. Do they all work? If not, find out why. Note if the odometer works. Look at the temperature gauge after the engine has warmed up. Is it well under the danger area? If the car has an oil pressure gauge, the pressure should be over 60 pounds or over 4.8 bar at red line. 54 and 55. Does the engine pull the car away easily or does it show signs of missing, hesitation, or backfires? Check the color of the exhaust on acceleration. If it is a bluish black smoke when accelerating, it could indicate worn piston rings, an expensive repair. 56. While driving, stomp on the accelerator pedal and bring the RPMs to 4,000. Let off the accelerator pedal. Do you see smoke out the rearview mirror? If so, this could indicate worn valve guides, a costly repair. Caution, do this test in an open area only. If you're not accustomed to Porsche acceleration, you could be in for an unexpected surprise, especially if you're in traffic. 57. Test the brakes. Do they pull the car to the right or left? 58. Take the car up to about 55 miles an hour. Put it in neutral and begin to coast. Listen for any noticeable humming noises. Some sound is always audible, but humming sounds from the transmission or wheel bearings are unacceptable. 59 and 60. Notice any odd suspension feel or unusually noisy sounds coming from the rear of the car when driving on a rougher than normal road. This could indicate worn out suspension bushings on the rear trailing arms which support the rear wheels. When the car is in motion, see if it drifts either right or left. Drifting could indicate suspension wear or front wheel misalignment. 61. After driving the car, shut off the engine. 62. Does it restart easily? If not, this could be a sign of several different problems. 62. Make sure to check under the engine after the test drive and look for any oil leaks. Let the engine idle a minute or two to see if any oil drips down. 63. After the test drive, let the engine and exhaust cool. After the exhaust has cooled, check the color and feel of the buildup inside the exhaust pipes. On a properly running engine, the deposits should be tan and dry in appearance. If you find heavy black deposits of soot, the engine is running too rich. If you find black oily deposits, skip this car. It may be in need of major engine service. 64. It has always been our practice to carefully inspect cars which have many high performance modifications made to their engines. If you buy the car and the engine modifications have been made, you may be required by law to have your car comply before you can get it licensed. Air quality is now monitored in many states. Standards set by law now exist that must be met to register a car. It is highly recommended that a car be checked by a state recognized service center before the purchase is made. Laws vary state to state. In California, the seller of the car is responsible for the car's compliance to air quality standards. However, this is not the case everywhere.
9.30 inspections during the test drive. Sixty-five. Let the owner of the car do the first part of the test drive for you. Ask that he drive the car like he normally does, so you get the idea of how a turbo runs. Pay special attention here. Heavy, constant use of the turbo will result in accelerated wear of the parts. On the other hand, a timid driving style will have the same wearing effects. A driving style with a turbo used on demand only will result in a more normal turbo life which is 40 to 60,000 miles. A special note, turbo failure will result in an inoperable engine. 66. Listen to the engine when under acceleration. The turbo, when fully functioning, will spin at 50,000 RPMs and make a subtle whine. A failing turbo bearing will result in an obvious turbo whine. Listen for this. 67. Note the boost gauge at the bottom of the tack. While driving on an open road, look for full turbo boost on the gauge. It should read 0.8 bar. Caution. Do this test in an open area only. Turbo acceleration after 3,000 RPMs is dramatic. 68. Watch the owner of the turbo after a test drive. Look for proper cool-down procedure. It is recommended that the engine cool down at idle for two to three minutes after driving because it brings the turbo temperatures down as well as leaving the parts properly lubricated for the next startup. This procedure will prevent premature turbo bearing failure. If you don't observe this habit, caution is recommended on higher mileage cars. This concludes our inspections. It is of great value to inspect a number of cars for sale to see what is being offered in different price ranges. Before your purchase, we again recommend that you put the car on a hoist. You will more easily see mechanical problems as well as structural body problems in this position. Our worksheet outlines the essential steps for selecting a good quality 911 or 930 using body and mechanical inspections. We have covered over 25 years of the 911 development. A detailed chart at the end of your worksheet will show the range of horsepower and engine sizes available in 911 and 930s. As you begin your search, you will find that the problems and situations we have highlighted will show up in varying degrees. These are sometimes the result of age and level of car maintenance. The more documented history you have about a car, the better. If you apply what you've learned in this video, you will see your future Porsche in a totally different light. Remember to take your time and look at more than just a few cars. Look at cars in a wider year and price range than you originally planned. Value is in the perception of the seller and not all sellers think alike. For example, a well-maintained 1978 911 could be a better buy than a racy 1983 Cabriolet that's been around the country a few times. By the way, all cars are not in excellent condition and all California cars are not rust free. A car currently licensed in California may not have started out there. Try to separate fact from fantasy. You'll soon find out that one man's excellent condition car is another man's driver. And yes, you can get over 200,000 miles on some well-maintained 911 engines. Change your oil every 3,000 miles and keep up with general maintenance. With this in mind, you will soon find out why the car's popularity has remained so strong. So whether your interest lies in a 1965 911 or newer style Carrera 4, we hope to see you on the road soon.